flap that is present between the esophagus and the stomach is called as the gastroesophageal flap. So first we have the pharynx which serves as a common passage for food and air and uh, then that pharynx divides into the trachea and the foot pipe. So the large intestine is again of three regions. It is made up of the cecum, the colon and the rectum. Goblet cells which secretes mucus that helps in lubrication. Hello everyone, a warm welcome to a new session on chapter 16 that is digestion and absorption. I am Dr. Divya, biology faculty with the Ashram Pre University College, Mysore, Temple of Excellence. So we all know that food is very important for the human beings, right? So the food that we take in has to be digested. So in this particular chapter or in this particular session of this chapter, we shall discuss about the different organs that are present in the alimentary canal or the digestive system. So the digestive system is very important for a human being, right? Because whatever food we take in, will it directly enter into our stomach and directly be utilized by the body? No. The complex food such as the carbohydrates, the lipids and the fats and the proteins that are present in the food has to be broken down into simpler forms by various digestive enzymes and they have to pass through the elementary canal therefore for the digestion process to complete. So we first need to understand the digestive system. So the digestive system of a human body begins with the oral cavity that is the mouth. So in the mouth we have the oral cavity. It begins with the mouth and it ends with the anus. So Ingestion of food, that is the entry of food is through the mouth, right? And its ejection is through the or its assimilation is through the anus. So, between the mouth and the anus which forms the elementary canal of the digestive system, there are different types of parts that are present. Say for example, in the mouth is present the oral cavity which consists of the teeth and all that. So, all these parts in detail we will study in this particular slides. And in the mouth itself, there is presence of the parotid glanda and the submaxillary and the sublingual gland. So, all these are the glands which help in the secretions of the saliva, right? So, that is why they are present inside the mouth. And next continues to the pharynx, which is the throat. And the pharynx continues through to the esophagus. So, here esophagus, we are talking about esophagus because it is the food pipe. We are not talking about trachea here. Why? Because it is the windpipe. Because we are dealing with the chapter digestion and absorption, we need to concentrate only on the food pipe here. It leads to esophagus. The esophagus leads to the stomach and the stomach, it leads to the duodenum that is the small intestine and it small intestine leads to the large intestine. So it leads to the large intestine that is the colon wherein there is presence of the transverse colon and the ascending colon. And next there is in the large intestine there is one more part called as the vermiform appendix which is a vestigial organ which is of no use to the body. And then comes the rectum. The large intestine leads to the rectum and the rectum leads to the anus which is the last part of the elementary canal. So each of these starting from the mouth, what are the parts inside the mouth, what happens inside the mouth, starting from there each and every organ we shall study related to the elementary canal. So talking about the elementary canal, as I told you elementary canal begins with an anterior opening which is nothing but the mouth right so it begins with the mouth and it opens out posteriorly through the anus that is whatever undigested food is left in the large intestine it will come out through the anus out of the body so it begins with the mouth wherein we take in the food and the exit of the food undigested food is through the anus so first let's talk about the mouth which is the first part wherein the food has to enter into first we put food into a mouth right so the mouth it actually leads to the buccal cavity or the oral cavity so when you open your mouth what what do you get to see inside that the buccal cavity it is also called as the oral cavity right so we shall study what is present in the oral cavity because all this is important because if mouth alone is there and inside you don't have a oral cavity 
then there is no digestion occurring because we need to achieve the food properly and to achieve the food oral cavity is needed. So that is why we shall study what are there in the oral cavity. So oral cavity has a large number of teeth and a muscular tongue. So it has teeth, the set of teeth that are there in the oral cavity and also it has a muscular tongue. And each tooth that is embedded in an oral cavity is embedded in the socket of the jaw bone. As you can see here, these are the sockets of the jaw bone, these structures. So these are the structures in which the oral cavities or the teeth are embedded. It is placed in the oral cavity. That is in the jaw bone, there are sockets like how the uh, plugs are fit into properly, right? Just like that, in our jaws also, sockets are present and in those sockets, the uh, teeth are embedded. And this type of attachment of the teeth to the sockets that are present in the jaw bone are called as the thecodont. And majority of the mammals, including the human beings, they actually uh, have two sets of teeth, right? We have two sets of teeth in a lifetime. When we are born, that is during a certain period of age, we have the milk teeth. And later on, as we grow, the milk teeth falls off. And in that place, the adult teeth comes, right? And that particular condition is called as diphyodont. Di means two. So, two sets of teeth we have, wherein the first set of teeth is formed, it is the temporary milk teeth or it is also called as the deciduous teeth. And this deciduous teeth or the temporary milk teeth is later on as we grow, it gets replaced by a set of permanent or the adult teeth. So, therefore, two forms are there. That is why it is called as diphodont condition. So, what is thecodont? The arrangement of the teeth in the sockets that are present in the jaw bone is called as the thecodont and in humans and other mammals the teeth are present in two sets of their life that is one is the temporary milk teeth or it is also called as the deciduous teeth and the second one is the permanent teeth or the adult teeth it is called as diphyodont condition so you can see here in sockets how the different tooths are being arranged. So, we have the incisors, we have the canine, the premolars and the molars arranged. So, each of these we shall study in detail. So, an adult human being has about 32 permanent teeth and they are of four types, right? They are of four types and it is called as heterodont condition. The four types of teeth present in the human mouth or human adult is called as the heterodont teeth because there are four types. So the first type is the incisors, the canine, the premolars and the molars. So as you can see, we have the incisors, so the first two. So this one and this one is the incisors. Then the third one is the canine and the fourth and the fifth is the premolar. And the sixth, seventh and the eighth is the molar. So, 32. How 32? Below also the same, above also the same. So, totally 32 teeth are there in the adult human being. And the arrangement of teeth in each half of the upper jaw and the lower jaw in the order. That is, it is arranged as in an order. That is, first at the front we have the incisors. Then at the sides we have the canine. And at the, after the canine is present, the premolar. And at the, after the premolar is present, the molar. So that is how they are arranged. And the dental formula of human is represented as 2, 1, 2, 3 divided by 2, 1, 2, 3. Wherein in the upper jaw, so this is the upper jaw. And this one is the lower jaw. So in the upper jaw, how many are there? Two incisors are there. One canine is there and two premolars are there, three molars are there. Likewise, there also in the lower jaw also two incisors are there, one canine is there, one premolar is there and three molar teeth are there. So, totally there are about 32 teeth. It is represented as 2123 divided by 2123. And next talking about the achieving process in the oral cavity. So, the hard chewing surface of the teeth is made up of enamel. 
So we all know that glossy appearance that we see on the teeth, it is nothing but enamel. And enamel is one of the hardest part in the human body. That is why any hard substances, if you bite into also, our teeth will not break. It is because of the presence of the enamel. And this teeth along with the enamel is the one that helps in mastication of food. Mastication of food means chewing. As you chew, the food mixes with the saliva and it forms just like a paste, right? So that is called as mastication of food. As and when we are chewing, the tongue also moves the food in our mouth, right? So the tongue is freely movable muscular organ which is attached to the floor of the oral cavity by the frenulum. So you can see a structure called as the frenulum or the frenulum. So in the frenulum, it is in the frenulum actually the uh, tongue is attached. So tongue is attached to the lower part of the mouth that is the frenulum. And the upper surface of the tongue has small projections called as the papilla. So you can see small dot like structures that are present on the tongue right the, that is the papilla and some of which bear taste buds and these papilla are the one which have the different taste buds that are situated on the tongue. After the oral cavity, the oral cavity leads into a short pharynx which have, serves as a common passage for food and air. So first we have the pharynx which serves as a common passage for food and air and uh, then that pharynx divides into the trachea and the food pipe. We shall first talk about the pharynx and then enter into the food pipe. So pharynx, so esophagus and the trachea open into the pharynx. When we are eating food, what happens? The trachea and the esophagus both should not be open. Why? Because both the pharynx leads into the trachea and the esophagus, right? So when we eat in food, the food enters into the pharynx and then it will have to pass through the esophagus. So if it has to pass through the esophagus, then there should be a flap that will cover the trachea. If the flap is not there, what might happen? The food will enter into the trachea as well, which is not good, right? So that is why the esophagus and the trachea that open into the pharynx and in the trachea, there is a cartilaginous flap that is present, which is called as epiglottis. So this epiglottis actually prevents the entry of the food into the glottis that is the trachea or the opening of the windpipe. So windpipe is nothing but trachea. So during swallowing. So when we are swallowing what happens through the pharynx it can enter into the trachea as well. So that is why there is a small flap that is present at the beginning of the trachea so that as and when we are trying to swallow the food the flap closes so that the food particles which we are swallowing does not enter into the trachea. So that is why it is very important. So you can see here, th this is pharynx region that is present. So the pharynx actually opens into the hypopharynx region and from the hypopharynx region, it opens into the trachea region. And not just that, not just to the trachea, it also opens into the esophagus. And in the trachea, there is presence of a flap-like structure which is called as the epiglottis that prevents the entry of food into the trachea and therefore the food can be directed only through the esophagus and then this pharynx leads into the esophagus. So we will not talk about trachea now. Why? Because trachea is a windpipe. It is involved in the process of respiration. But here we will talk only about esophagus because that is the one that which forms the elementary canal which further takes part in the digestion pro digestive process. So here talking about esophagus. So esophagus is a thin long tube which extends posteriorly passing through the neck, thorax and the diaphragm and it leads to a J-shaped bag like structure which is called as the stomach. So you can see here the esophagus. So this is the esophagus. It actually leads into the J-shaped like structure which is called as the stomach. So the masticated food what happens? It enters into the esophagus and it will reach the stomach. So a muscular spinster regulates the opening of esophagus into the stomach. Here also between the esophagus and the stomach there is a small flap being present. That flap is quite muscular in nature and it is called as the muscular spinster or it is also called as the gastroesophageal flap. 
So like how epiglottis was the flap that covered the trachea so that the food doesn't enter into the trachea, just like that between the esophagus, that is between the esophagus and the stomach, there is a flap that is present which is called as the gastroesophageal flap. This flap actually prevents the upward or the ulta movement of the food back into the esophagus. Why once the food if it enters into the stomach it should not move back to the esophagus right. So to prevent the moving back of the food towards the esophagus this particular flap is present. Okay so now we'll talk about the stomach because the esophagus leads to the stomach. So we need to talk about this particular j-shaped structure which is called as the stomach. So the stomach is located in the upper left portion of the abdomen. So it is located in the upper left portion of the abdominal cavity and the stomach is divided into four major parts. What are the four major parts? First one is a cardiac portion into which the esophagus opens. So we have a cardiac portion. As you can see the first part is the cardiac portion into which the esophagus actually opens into. So that is the cardiac portion. Next is a fundic region. So this is the fundic region or the fundus. Then next we have the pyloric region. Before the pyloric region there is a body which is the main central region of the stomach. So there is the body and next is the pyloric region. So this pyloric region actually opens into the small intestine. It is the first part of the stomach that opens into the small intestine. The esophagus opens into the cardiac region of the stomach and the stomach opens into the small intestine. So next this is the top portion of the small intestine which is also called as the duodenum the small intestine. So next we shall study about the small intestine. So to understand the process of digestion and absorption of food we need to understand about each of these organs. What are the different parts it is made up of, where it is exactly situated all that we need to understand. So next we will move on to the small intestine. So the small intestine is again divided into three regions that is a C-shaped duodenum and then one more part region of the small intestine is a long coiled middle portion which is called as the jejunum and the third one is a highly coiled ileum. So if you can see here the first part of the stomach it is C-shaped. So the stomach is a J-shaped structure. Pyloric region of the stomach enters into the or continues towards the in small intestine wherein the first part of the small intestine is C-shaped as you can see here. It is called as the duodenum and the next part is the jejunum which is folded and the third part which is highly coiled it is called as the ileum region. So these are the different regions of the small intestine. So the opening of the stomach into the duodenum is guarded by the pyloric spinster. So different flaps. So the flap which actually covers the trachea is the epiglottis, right? And the flap that is present between the esophagus and the stomach is called as the gastroesophageal flap, right? Just like that here, there is a flap that is present between the stomach and the duodenum. It is called as the pyloric spinster. So you can see here the flap present between the stomach and the duodenum. It is called as pyloric spinster. So why again? Because whatever food has entered into the small intestine should not go back and enter into the stomach. So to prevent the re-entry of the food that has left from the stomach, here a flap is being present which is called as the pyloric spinster and the ileum opens into the large intestine. So ileum is the one that opens into the large intestine which is also called as the colon. It opens into the large intestine. So next we shall study about the large intestine. So the large intestine is again of three regions. It is made up of the cecum, the colon and the rectum. So as you can see here the large intestine it consists of the cecum so the cecum ends in the appendix, then it consists of the rectum which ends in the anus and it consists of the colon which is the main part of the large intestine. 
So here cecum is a small blind sac which actually consists of some symbiotic microorganism. So cecum consists of some symbiotic microorganism because there are a lot of beneficial bacteria that are present in the gut or in our intestine, right? So where are these bacteria actually present? They are actually present in the cecum region. So it is a place for a symbiotic microorganisms to live there. Symbiotic means they are uh, mutually, it is working with the intestine and the uh, making use of the intestine and also in turn giving something to the intestine and therefore the, to the overall well-being of the digestion of a human being. And after the cecum, there is presence of a narrow finger-like tubular projection which is called as the vermiform appendix. I told you vermiform appendix. So near the cecum, the cecum ends in a vermiform appendix. So it is a finger-like projection. This vermiform appendix is a vestigial organ that is of no use to the human body. So therefore it is a vestigial organ that arises from the cecum and then the cecum opens into the colon. So this cecum as you can see at one end of the cecum this or the cecum ends in the vestigial organ which is called as the appendix and the cecum opens into the colon. So this is the colon. So it opens into the colon. So next talking about the colon. The colon is divided into four parts that is an ascending colon, then a transverse colon and then a descending colon and then a sigmoid colon. So you can see here one is the ascending that is movement, upward movement. The direction is upward here so that is why it is a ascending colon. The second one is descending, the direction is downward. Why? The food, undigested food will travel like this, it will ascend like this, then it will transverse like this. So this is a transverse colon, it will transverse like this and then it will descend like this. After it descends, it has to enter into a S shaped structure. If you can see here, this looks like a S, right? So that is why it is called as a sigmoid colon and then it will end into the rectum and the rectum will end into the anus. So the colon is divided into four uh, regions. One is the ascending colon, then we have the transverse colon, then the descending colon, the sigmoid colon and then to ending towards the rectum and the anus. And the descending part of the colon opens into the rectum and the rectum opens into the anus. So anus is the last part of the digestive system. As you can see, the rectum opens into the anus. So this is about the different parts of the elementary kennel. So now we have understood about the different parts of the elementary kennel. So we shall study in detail about the elementary kennel. So the wall of the elementary kennel. So externally what all the organ, what is the shape of the organ, what is it made up of all that we studied. Now in detail we shall look into the wall of the elementary kennel. So the wall of the elementary kennel from the esophagus to the rectum so they are all tube like structures right starting from the esophagus up till the rectum all are tube like structures. So the wall of these are made up of four layers one is the serosa, the muscularis, the submucosa and the mucosal layer. So if we take the section of that is elementary kennel right from the esophagus up till the anus we can find they are made up of four walls one is the serosa, then we have the muscularis wall, then we have the submucosa, then comes the mucosa and in between these there is a cavity being present because it is a tube, esophagus is a tube, our stomach is a tube, our intestines are a tube like structure, anus is also a tube like structure. So all are covered by three layers and in the center there is a cavity which is called as the lumen being present. So these are the four different layers that cover the elementary kennel. So next talking about the wall of the elementary kennel in detail. So what are the different walls? The serosa, the muscularis, the mucosa and the submucosa. Each of these in detail we shall study. So first talking about the serosa. So serosa is the outermost layer as you can see it is the outermost layer. It is the outermost layer and it is made up of a very thin mesothelium with some connective tissue. 
So it is made up of very thin mesothelium with some connective tissue and the muscularis. So muscularis is actually formed by smooth muscles. It is made up of smooth muscles which are arranged into an inner circular and an outer longitudinal layer. As you can see they are made up of smooth muscles. Smooth muscles means they will not have striation. So these smooth muscles which are of two types that is the inner circular muscle and the outer circular muscle. So these two smooth muscles that are there together they will form the muscularis. So next talking about the submucosal layer. So next to the muscularis that is inner to the inner circular muscularis is present the submucosal layer. So this submucosal layer is also made up of loose connective tissue which contains a lot of nerve, blood and lymph vessels. So next is mucosa. Lymph vessels are all important for the passage of food. So that is why it is important. Next is mucosa. Mucosa is the innermost membrane layer that is present just below the submucosa. So here mucosa is the innermost layer that lines the lumen or the cavity of the elementary kennel. So if you can see this is the cavity of the elementary kennel. So lining the cavity of the elementary kennel you can see the mucosal layer. These are the different layers. So we shall study about mucosa again in detail. So mucosa, this layer forms irregular folds called rugae. So if you can see this mucosa, we had understood the cavity, right? So here is the cavity. This cavity is covered by the mucosal layer. So if you can see here, mucosa are made up of finger-like projections and they are made up of a lot of folds which are called as a rugae. And they also have lots of small finger like foldings called as villi. So they have large number of larger folds called as the rugae and also they have small finger like folds or finger like projections which are called as the villi. And the cells lining the villi they actually produce a lot of microscopic projections which is called as the microvilli. These microvilli acts like a brush. So why is it important? Because it, for the movement of food, these brush-like structures should be there. So for the movement of food throughout the esophagus and all that, throughout our elementary kennel, the brush-like structure should be present. So that is why they have numerous, these villi have numerous small projections called as the microvilli. And these modifications actually increase the surface area of the elementary kennel enormously. So therefore, mucosa is the innermost layer which covers the cavity and when you observe the mucosa, mucosa has a large number of folds that are present which are called as rugae and near the, apart from that they also have a large number of small finger like projections which is called as the villi and in the villi there is a large number of microscopic projections called as the microvilli which form a brush like structure which helps in the movement of food particles and not just that all these modifications actually these foldings that are there that is the rugae, villi and all that increase the surface area of the elementary kennel. So this is about the mucosa. Next talking about the villi. So villi, what are villi? They are nothing but the finger like structures that are present right. So these villi actually they are supplied with a network of capillaries and a large lymph vessel called as the lacteal. So these villi have a network. Can you see? They have a network of capillaries and they have a tubular structure called as the or a lymph vessel. So the lymph vessel is nothing but a tubular structure that is present in between the capillaries and it is called as the lacteal. And the mucosal epithelium, if you see, it has a large number of goblet cells and these are the goblet cells which secretes mucus that helps in lubrication. So mucus is important for easy passage of food. Any surface is dry, then the movement of a substance through it is very difficult. And if a substance is moist and wet, then the movement of uh, any of the substance through it or any tube is moist and wet, then the movement through it is very easy, right? So that is why the mucosal epithelium that is there will have, so the mucosal epithelium, it has a large number of goblet cells and these goblet cells are the 
ones which secrete the mucus therefore keeping the alimentary canal moist for the easy passage of the or movement of the food and the mucosa also forms glands in the stomach as well which is called as the gastric glands and also it forms crypts in between the bases of the villi so you can see crypts that are formed at the base of the villi so at the base of the villi there is presence of the crypts so these crypts are called as the crypts of libercul and all the four layers that we had studied that is the serosa the muscularis the mucosa and the submucosa all these modifications in different parts of the elementary canal so all the four layers show modification in the different parts of the elementary canal but we all know that the complete elementary canal is covered by four layers that is the serosa the muscularis the submucosa and the mucosa and we have studied about each of these layers one by one and we also understood that it is in the mucosa layer that the goblet cells are present which keeps the elementary canal moist therefore for the proper movement of the food next let us study about the digestive glands that are produced so in the oral cavity we had learned about the parotid glands the submandibular glands this all those right apart from the salivary glands that are present there are various organs that act like glands so what are the digestive glands the first one is the salivary glands then the liver and then it is the pancreas so each of these we shall study one by one so first talking about the salivary glands so the salivary glands is present in the oral cavity that is in the mouth right so this saliva is mainly produced by three pairs of salivary gland one is the parotid gland which is present at the cheek so parotid glands are present inside the mouth in the cheek region which also helps in the secretion of the saliva next is the submaxillary or the submandibular gland which is present at the lower jaw so uh, the gland that is present at the lower jaw which is called as the submandibular or submaxillary gland and the one more gland that is present below the tongue which is called as the sublingual gland so it is easy to remember sublingual means lingual is speaking or a accent or a language right so to speak what do we use the tongue so therefore the salivary gland that is or the gland that is present at the base of the tongue is called as the, the sublingual gland so you can see the parotid gland so parotid gland is present at the cheek so you can see it is present at the cheek region then at the the submaxillary gland which is present at the lower jaw can you see here it is present at the lower jaw the submandibular gland and the parotid gland is present at the cheek region and then there is a gland that is present at the base of the tongue or below the tongue which is called as the sublingual gland so these are the different glands that are present in the salivary gland of the digestive system or the elementary canal so next talking about one more gland which is the largest gland among all the glands so uh, when compared to the salivary gland and the pancreas the liver is the largest gland so liver is the largest gland of the body and it weighs about 1.2 to 1.5 kg in a adult human and it is situated in the abdominal cavity just below the diaphragm and it is made up of two lobes so liver is the largest gland it is situated just below the diaphragm in the abdominal cavity and it is made up of actually two lobes the first lobe is called as the hepatic lobules so as you can see here it is the hepatic duct or the hepatic lobules and these hepatic lobules are the structural and functional units of the liver wherein they contain a large number of hepatic cells that are arranged in the form of cords so just like wire cords are nothing but wire right so how the cords are arranged just like that in the form of wire they are arranged that is the hepatic duct or the hepatic lobules and each lobule is covered by a thin connective tissue sheath which is called as the glycens capsule so the, the liver it is the largest gland and in that liver it is again divided into three types so or two lobules so in that two lobules one is the hepatic lobule 
the hepatic globules they are structural and functional unit of the liver and they uh, contain a lot of hepatic cells which are arranged in the form of cords and each of these lobules that are hepatic lobules are actually covered by a thin layer of connective tissue and it is called as the glissens capsule. We uh, came to know that there are hepatic lobules which forms the structural and functional unit of the hepatic cells in the liver. So the hepatic cells actually secrete bile. So this bile that is secreted by the hepatic cells, it has to be stored somewhere, right? So these bile actually, they pass through the hepatic ducts. So you can see here, they pass through the common hepatic duct and then they enter into the gallbladder. They get stored in the gallbladder. So they are hepatic ducts and it is stored and concentrated in thin muscular sac-like structure which is called as the gallbladder. And the duct of the gallbladder which is called as the cystic duct. So if you can see the duct of the gallbladder, this one which is called as the cystic duct, this cystic duct actually along with the hepatic duct from the liver forms the common bile duct. So first what happens in the liver the hepatic cells are present. These hepatic cells will secrete the bile. That bile will be carried by the hepatic duct and it will be carried into the storage organ of for the bile which is the gallbladder. Then the gallbladder also have a tube like structure which is called as the gallbladder duct. And the gallbladder duct and the hepatic duct both perform the function of transporting the, uh, that is the former function of transporting the bile from the liver. And the bile duct and the pancreatic duct together open into the duodenum that is the small intestine as the common hepatopancreatic duct which is guarded by a spinster. So if you can remember we had studied about the spinster right. So there is a spinster that is it has to move into the hepatopancreatic duct. So before it moves into the duodenum and then into the intestine here there is presence of a small flap like structure which is called as the spinster that is the spinster of the odivi because the bile should not secrete back into the liver and the gallbladder right. So the liver secretes the bile that is stored in the gallbladder that gallbladder carries the bile into the intestine and therefore if it has to that is through the pancreatic duct and the bile duct it opens together and carries the bile into the duodenum. From the duodenum or the intestine, the bile should not travel back into the liver and into the gallbladder. It has to not travel, then there should be present a small flap like structure which is called as the spinster of odi. So that is the reason why spinster of odi is present. So next talking about the pancreas. This is the last digestive gland that is present which is the pancreas. So the pancreas is a compound which is elongated organ that is situated between the limbs of the C-shaped duodenum. So if you can see here between the limbs of the C-shaped duodenum, so here the C-shaped duodenum as you can see. We had, remember we had studied about the intestine, that is small intestine wherein there is presence of the C-shaped duodenum. So between the C-shaped duodenum, you can see the location of the pancreas. So pancreas is the gland that is situated between the limbs of the C-shaped duodenum. And the exocrine portion of the gland of the pancreas actually secretes an alkaline pancreatic juice which contains a lot of pancreatic enzymes and also the endocrine portion of the pancreas secretes hormones such as insulin and glucagon. So the main function of the pancreas is the exocrine region or the outer region of the pancreas it secretes the pancreatic juice containing a lot of pancreatic enzymes and the inner side of that is the endocrine of the pancreas secretes lots of hormones such as the insulin and the glucagon. So this is about the digestive gland that is the pancreas. So I hope you understood this session well wherein in detail we studied about the different structures that are involved or different organs that are involved in the 
elementary canal of the digestive system of a human being. Now, because we know about these organs, we know exactly what are they made up of and what are the three different types of glands that are present in the digestive system. One is the salivary gland because the digestion begins in the saliva. Next comes the gland secreted by the liver that is the liver and next is the pancreas. So because we know about this in the next session it will be easy for us to understand the role of various digestive enzymes in uh, the process of digestion in the human body. So in each of the different elementary kennel regions of the elementary kennel what are the different digestive enzymes that are secreted and what role do these digestive enzymes in the conversion of the complex food into simpler absorbable forms. So we shall meet again in the coming session. Thank you.